Before I start, I'd like to thank Tim for the opportunity to share with you what I believe the Lord is saying to his people in this nation and to us here in Christ Church. But in order to do that, it's important to share some background history, especially as I know that other Christians worldwide have experienced the same things as I have in the past, and I'm seeing signs that currently some are experiencing similar callings. John Comer, the author of The Elimination of Hurry, is just one of those people. Between February 1985 and December 9, 1991, I felt God speaking to me in a very powerful way. The words were usually accompanied by what we may term as spiritual ha experiences and happenings, pictures, dreams, visions, and extraordinary and, and astonishing happenings. Always there were accompanying scriptures, reminding me of God's eternal and unchanging word. These words and experiences were recorded at the time and shared with others, particularly with fellow members of the St Albans Diocesan Group for Renewal. This group, sadly not in, experience, not in existence today, was accountable to the Bishop of Hartford. It was part of the charismatic wing of the church and belonged to the National Anglican Renewal Movement, or ARM for short. We were a 50-50 mix of clergy and lay people. We worshipped and prayed together. We waited upon the Lord, listening to what he had to say. We shared and tested prophecies and were responsible within the diocese for conducting days of renewal of faith for the parishes and for teaching courses on the church's ministry of healing. As a member of ARM, we were able to keep watch and reflect on what the Lord was saying and showing his people throughout our country. In a nutshell, words given to me were weighed and accepted as coming from God. To paraphrase, the Lord showed me and others nationwide a number of things. Firstly, the need for change. His priests, that is, the royal priesthoods of all believers, ordained and non-ordained, must change individually and corporately so that they could fulfill the commission that they had been given. Secondly, the world's and the church's great need for healing and reconciliation. The need for unity amongst his people. There were many divisions and much dissent amongst the church. Actually, we have one of the banners there with the words I was given about unity. Now, the need for unity was linked with the need to recognize and be part of the wider communion of saints, where there is true community and true fellowship. We are one throughout the ages, regardless of age, sex, class, job, or denomination. In worshiping the one true living God together, we are united in our faith and task, whether physically alive or dead, we are one in Christ and fellow citizens in God's everlasting kingdom. Fourthly, the Lord was saying that he was about to shake the nations so that his glory would be seen. Fifthly, he wanted his children to wake up from their slumbers so that the light of Christ would shine on them and that they could fulfill the commission that had been given to them. They were to go and make nation, uh, disciples of all nations and teach them to obey everything Christ taught them. Sixthly, he was calling to and leading his people into the desert where they would be prepared for mission and their eternal home. In the desert, they would learn to wait on the Lord and to listen to what he was saying. There they would learn holiness, discipline and spiritual warfare for the time was coming when life would become extremely hard and difficult and persecution would be rife. More importantly, God's people were to enter the desert in humility and repentance. They had to learn the lessons of the desert and seek the treasures of darkness. And lastly, 
His church was standing at a crossroads, not knowing which way to turn. His people were to go back to their roots, look for the ancient paths, and walk in the good way. Now, since 1985, nothing has changed. The church is even more divided and is not fulfilling its commission. Now, the things which I and others were shown are in connected, interconnected and fit together. Each is lengthy and could be a talk or even a course in itself. This morning, however, I've been asked to speak about the desert. Now, although the desert call began in 1989, let me start in 1990. Before my family and I went to Italy for our holiday, I felt the Lord saying that he had something to show me and whilst I was there. And what I saw must be relayed to the Archbishop. Incredible indeed. On the 21st of July, 1990, my family, whilst walking in the Sorrento Hills with another family whom we had met in the hotel and had become friendly, came across a monastery named Il Deserto the desert. Now the story is long, but in brief, Robin, our newly found friend, was a priest in the Diocese of Bath and Wells, and I had already shared with him what I felt the Lord saying about his calling us into the desert. Now Robin, convinced that visitors were welcomed at the monastery, found us all a route into the grounds, and together we walked to the monastery building. We were stopped in our tracks as we saw the words engraved upon the turret. Ego vox clementis in deserto, tempest breve est. Now, I had never studied Latin at school, but David, my husband, and Robin had done so. They had a stab at translating the words. I am the voice calling in the desert. Time is short. The significance of one word, clementis, however, evaded them. The verb had an unusual conjugation. On my return home, I took the words to a classics teacher. And this is where there is a past link with Christ Church. The person to whom I took them was Rachel Harris, a fellow member of the then congregation. Some of you may remember her. She had been my form tutor at the Luton High School and had taught Latin. She translated the words as, I am the voice calling over and over again in the desert. Time is short. Conjugation of the word clementis indicated repetition. Over and over and over and over again. Now, you may be wondering what was so significant about these words. Well, a few months before our holiday, Robin's diocese had called a national meeting of our membership because it felt that the Lord was saying something important about the desert. But they didn't quite understand what the Lord was saying. I was one of a small number of representatives from St Albans Diocese who were sent to share our insights and participate in that conference. As you can imagine, those words on the monastery turret provoked much discussion amongst our two families. Bath and Wells Diocese was already developing a training course entitled Streams and Ditches, which was based on Isaiah 43, verse 19, which says, See, I am doing a new thing. I am making a way in the desert and streams in wasteland. But even more astonishingly, during that holiday, Robin was informed that his boss, George Carey, the bishop to whom he was chaplain, had just been made archbishop designate. And so it was that our experiences and those important words were delivered to the archbishop by Robin. Today, the words Ego vox clementis in deserto, tempest breve est, 
return to Christ church. So what is so important about these words? Why are we being called to enter the desert? What is the desert? What is so important about the desert? Where is the desert? And why is time short? We are being called into the desert because we need to change. There is a need for unity amongst God's people in faith and mission. There is a great need for repentance and healing in God's church. God wants his people to wake up and be prepared for mission. His training ground is the desert. When I and others first started hearing the call in the, to the desert in 1989, I looked up the word in a dictionary. The desert or wilderness implies many things. In our modern day, we might think of a solitary, desolate or lowly place, an arid and barren place where there is no water, nothing grows, a wasteland, a place divided of culture, food or closeness to other people, a place of disaster and death. Now we know that the Septuagint, the earliest translation we have of the Hebrew writers, was written in Greek, where the word for desert, which occurs more than 272 times in the Bible, is translated as eremos, meaning a solitary, desolate or lonely place. Let us, however, as God asks, go back to our spiritual roots and look for the ancient paths. Let us consider not Greek nor Roman words, but the Hebraic words for desert, midbar. Then perhaps we will begin to see the desert in a new light. Midbar has a couple of meanings. Firstly, it is used to refer to uninhabited land where human beings are nomads. They are passing through. Secondly, it is used to describe a wild field where shepherds lead their sheep to graze and where wild animals live. So the desert is not necessarily an arid place. It can include scrublands, steppe and pasture lands suitable for grazing and supporting sheep. Looking a bit deeper into the Hebrew word, Hebrew has no vowels, so the, the word midbar is spelt M D. B -R. Midbar has the same letters as another Hebrew word, medaba, M-D-B-R, meaning speaking. Both words came, come from the same root, meaning to speak, spoken word, or commandment. So in Hebrew and Jewish thinking, the desert spiritually was not a place of hopelessness, Rather, it is the place where God spoke to the Israelites during their 40 years of wandering in the desert. It is a place God uses to speak with his people. It is a place of revelation. What does the Bible teach us about the desert? The wilderness or desert is God's training ground. If you know your way about the desert, it is a place of safety from en enemies. Now the photo which has been offered to you this morning is that of Qumran in the Judean desert. It was taken from the hilltop fortress of Masada to which the Jews fled under persecution in AD 70. You can actually see the caves which the Essenes hid their greatest treasures, their scriptures, the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is the place, the desert that is, is the place in which God's people learn the route to a deeper spiritual life and discover the treasures of darkness, which are waiting to be located under the shifting sands of time that bury and obscure them from sight. As in our reading this morning from Proverbs, if we cry out for insight, it is the place in which we gain wisdom and understanding. And you might just like to drop the reference to the reading this morning on the back of that. 
God's faithful word, the Bible, and his unchanging laws open our eyes to the covenant relationship between God and his people so that we may know that the Lord is God and calls his people by name. The desert is a place of preparation, education and testing where we learn to remain faithful in our relationship with God under the most adverse of conditions. It is a place in which his people might locate the oasis where they might rest and be refreshed. It is a place of solitude and simplicity which enables us to lay down all idols and all that is unnecessary, making it easier for us to see and understand our real priorities and mission. It is the place where he speaks to us and reveals himself to us more and more as we listen. It is the place in which we learn to slow down, wait, listen to, and depend on God, who will not be hurried. The Lord does everything in his own time, not in ours. The desert or wilderness is a place of stark reality, where we are stripped of self-importance, self-righteousness, self-seeking, and personal authority. The Lord knows and sees all. There is no hiding place in busyness or good works. God lays everything bare and asks, who do you say that I am? The desert is a place of struggle and spiritual warfare. It is the place where we learn to overcome dangers, conquer our fears and emerge in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is in the desert that we learn to worship. It is where we see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Lord. <clears throat> Sorry. Finally, it is a place wherein, like the Israelites, we may wander for great periods of time as we perceive the meaning and consequences of our rebellious natures and grasp the significance of God's leading and provision for his people. It is the place where God chooses to lead us for his love is never more gloriously revealed than in the very places or situations that the world shuns and finds most dark, uninviting, distressing or painful. Let us remember that all God's prophets were desert people, from Moses, Elijah, prophets during the exile, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Haggai, just to name but a few to John the Baptist, and of course, to Jesus himself. We can learn much from them and their experiences. Moses was out in the desert tending his father-in-law's sheep when he encountered the burning bush. He was told to take his shoes off because he was standing on holy land and first heard God's voice telling him he was to lead his people out of slavery into the promised land via the desert. He was with the Israelites in the desert when he listened to God's voice again and wrote down the Ten Commandments. Now, one of those commandments concerned the Sabbath, and we're going to hear more about that next week. These commandments form the Israelites' rule of life. They form Jesus' rule of life. They form our rule of life. We are God's people. We are part of God's family. As you know, Jesus abbreviated them to two. Love your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. And love your neighbour as yourself. However, Jesus came not to change the law but to fulfil it. All ten are still as important today as the day they were written. Now, all prophets lived in ungodly times very similar to our own. All prophets lived amongst and dealt with rebellious peoples. They were lone voices crying out in the wilderness. They spoke out against wrong values and practices, calling the people back into their covenant relationship with the Lord. The people invariably refused to listen. The Israelites built their golden calf 
And during the exiles of the Jews in Babylon, the people rejected their God who had brought them out of slavery. They no longer worshipped him and followed in his ways. Rather, they absorbed the ways and beliefs of the Babylonians around them. Doesn't this all sound too familiar in today's society? Let's recall John the Baptist, who in the desert of Judea preached a message of repentance and baptism for the forgiveness of sins. As foretold by Isaiah, he was a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. What a sight to behold for the, flock, the crowds that flocked to him. A rugged man, living simply, wearing clothes made of camel hair, with a leather belt, belt around his waist and eating locusts and honey. And we will hear more about simplicity in two weeks' time. What does Jesus and his experience teach us? Unlike the prophet Isaiah, who, as we heard last week, fled into the desert fearing for his life, Jesus' experience was not because he was a sinner, disobedient or afraid. He was willingly led. It was because he was obedient to his father's calling, his baptism and anointing. He was willingly led and guided by the Holy Spirit in the desert as he prepared for his ministry here on earth. Led into the desert as the son of God, he was tested as a man. He prayed, fasted and considered his strategy. He wrestled with his identity as a son of God and faced three temptations whose patterns are common to us all. Firstly, after fasting for 40 days and nights, Jesus was tempted to use his status and turn stones into bread, providing food for himself. Consider also that a lot of ordinary people in Israel were also poor and hungry. Jesus had come to serve heal and save them. If he provided for the people's physical needs, then surely they must follow him. But what was more important, earthly bodies or the preparation for eternal bodies? Jesus knew that life was about more than the physical and emotional. It was all about the soul. Dismissing this temptation, Jesus replied with scripture, it is written that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Secondly, Jesus was tempted to throw himself off the highest point of the temple and rely on God's angels to break his fall. After all, scripture promised that no harm would befall him. Should he demonstrate his trust in God and prove who he was? Certainly people would be caught up in the excitement and theatre of it all and follow him. But this temptation required wisdom, understanding and balance. The greatest display of faith wasn't in exciting and stunning demonstrations, but in a quiet, balanced trust. Resisting the temptation of the abuse of power and the use of the spectacular he replied with scripture, It is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And lastly, Jesus was tempted to use the world's way of gaining power and glory to advance the kingdom of God and his purposes. Should he win over and make an unforgettable mark on the world by possessions, power and authority? What was worthwhile in life? Jesus neither sought nor coveted power. Instead, he exercised authority, graciously received from his Father, and yet set aside. His power was best exercised in weakness. So Jesus finally sent the devil packing with the words of Scripture. It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Look hard enough. And you will see many examples in the world, our nation, and in God's church, where we put creature comforts before God, where we look for proof of God's existence, including through the use of the spectacular. 
where we crave power and authority and where power is abused. Jesus went into the desert to learn how to fight. The desert was not a place of weakness, but a place of strength. He engaged in spiritual warfare and emerged from the desert victorious in God's word. We are called to do likewise. If God's church is to have any influence in the 21st century, it must change. If it is to embrace and accept Jesus' commission to bring God's word, healing and reconciliation to the world, it must be prepared for the mammoth task and hard spiritual battle ahead of it. It must answer God's calling and enter the desert both willingly and in repentance in order to be trained in how to survive the world's darkness and in how to fight using appropriate weapons and armory. We all need to be able to put on that belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, take up the helmet of salvation and the shield of faith and arm ourselves with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The desert is a challenging place, but a place of renewal and encounter with God helps us to grow and mature spiritually as well as test our faith patience and determination to serve God and where is the desert the desert is all around us if I ask for a show of hands I imagine there aren't many of us who do not feel in a dry and barren place where we are wrestling with all manner of problems and pressures which bring us low some truly horrific In the past, there have been individuals or groups who have taken God's call into the desert literally and have moved into an arid desert area, hoping that the silence and solitude which would enable them to hear God's voice and bring peace. In this country, we can't do that. We do not have desert areas. However, in craving God's peace, what we can do is locate or create quiet places in the midst of our own wilderness experiences where we can be alone with God. In 1990, the Dyson Group for Renewal discovered a hidden treasure, an out-of-print book called Pustinia. It's the Russian word for desert. The book was written by Catherine Dweck Doherty, who was born into a wealthy Russian family After the revolution in 1917, she and her husband became penniless and were forced to learn to live how the poor lived. In her sufferings, she learned to be silent before the Lord and knew the treasures of entering the desert. In her book, she spoke of the desert as a place with no distractions to which individuals seeking to hear the Lord's voice could withdraw. It could be a physical place, a simple room, or even the silence of one's own heart. In her book, Catherine describes entering the Pustinia as a priestly affair. It is not a place to be used simply as a place of rest. Rather, it is a holy place, God's place, which may only be entered with right and truthful motives copy of her book is in our library for anybody to borrow. Now let us finally return to those words which were brought to Christ Church 23 years ago. Ego vox clementis in deserto, tempus breve est. I am the voice calling over and over again in the desert. Time is short. It is God who is calling to us over and over again. In each generation, he constantly calls to his people, inviting them to join with him and be with him in the desert. What does time is short mean? Let us go back to Haggai, a prophet during the exile. Post-exile, Haggai's intention was to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem in order to renew and restore the religious life and faith of the nation. 
However, he foresaw a time when God would shake all nations before filling this house with glory. Haggai, however, wasn't the only prophet to foresee a great shaking of the nations. Some 600 years later, the writer of Hebrews also foresaw a time of great shaking. Listen to what he said. Once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. That's Hebrews 12, verses 27 to 28. I and many others firmly believe that those days are now upon us. We are living in challenging and unprecedented times. We are seeing an increasing number of natural disasters, the toppling of various governments and the collapse of many financial and retail establishments. We are experiencing the consequences of COVID and bedbugs. There is the ongoing wicked situation in Ukraine and, of course, the evil happenings in Israel. On Monday, one of my newspaper's headlines was Horror as rescuers find hundreds of bodies at Rave where Hamas came out of the desert and opened fire. Hundreds of youngsters killed in the desert by terrorists. Israel has been visibly shaken. Israel was not prepared. It wasn't ready for this atrocity. The world has been shaken by these events. I mentioned earlier that the desert is a place of stark reality. We cannot ignore the stark reality of what is happening in Israel. It does and will affect us all. The whole world is waiting and watching Israel and its enemies. As Christians who are spiritually rooted in Judaism, what should we be doing? Firstly, we should remember that it is God's intention to bring Jew and Gentile believers together as one new man in Christ. As Christians, we are commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and have a duty to pray that Israel's leaders and peoples remember that they are a kingdom of priests and a holy people. We should be praying that they do not follow the ways of the world in their response to Hamas, but rather that they hear God's desert call to repentance and prayer, and that in unity they wait on the Lord and cry out to God for his wisdom to guide their military response to Hamas and to seek his word for the path to follow, which may be a light for revelations to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. In the verse from Hebrews, the words, once more I will shake, indicate the removing of what can be shaken so that anything which is not of God may fall. Again, as the writer of Hebrews says, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. That's Hebrews 12, 27 to 28. Two weeks ago today, at 5.52 in the morning, an email arrived in my inbox from Jerusalem. The writer had no idea what was soon to occur. I'm going to finish by reading a few sentences from that eloquent email which quoted Hebrews 12, 27 to 28. It is no secret that the earth has been going through a season of shaking. In some measure, shakings have come personally to the watchmen and intercessors of Israel and to the church. But contrary to outward appearances, it is not for evil, but for good. Do we understand 
that the Lord is preparing the whole earth for the most important event in history. Conditions are ripening for the consummation of God's plan of redemption for Israel and the nations. The situation calls for spiritual maturity in the church like never before. What we see not only can be shaken, but is being shaken even now. Geopolitics from Jerusalem to the uttermost parts of the earth quickens us to the temporality of all earthly kingdoms and agendas. God shakes them to remind us that they are created things, not eternal. Why? Because temporary things in our life must give way to eternal things. We often want to see hard things being shaken away and removed, yet God is not after establishing our comfort, but rather our readiness for his unshakable kingdom. I leave you with some questions which also apply to me. Are you prepared and ready for God's unshakable kingdom? Look around you. What do you see within the world, our nation, our church, within yourselves? What needs to change? Will you answer God's call and enter the desert willingly and in repentance? Tempus brevi est. Time is short. The Lord is near. Amen.